I was reading recently about a new gender identity. Gender identities are invented every week, pretty much. And there's a new one called aerogender, which shouldn't be confused with aerosexual. Aerosexual are people who are turned on by aeroplanes. Uh, this, the aero, which sounds perfectly sensible in comparison to what aerogender is. Aerogender is someone whose gender changes depending on their surroundings. So this is a person who can be a man one minute and a woman the next minute. You know, like, for example, a man who walks into a woman's changing rooms instantly becomes a woman and identifies as a woman. You know, very conveniently, he, the world moulds itself around his or her identity. And I thought, I had two, thing, two thoughts when I was reading about this uh, era gender, this changeable gender identity. The first is just how insane it is. You know, you, you, you should never, you should always try not to pathologise social phenomenon. Uh, that's a bad thing to do, generally speaking. But you do sometimes wonder if these people are slightly unhinged. You know, it's the split personality thing and they're describing it as an identity. It is a bit crazy. And my second thought was a more serious one, which is what I think that really speaks to, this idea that your, gen your whole gender could change so quickly depending on the room you walk into. What I think that really speaks to is how fragile and hollow and changeable identity is today, literally changeable. It can change at the drop of a hat. And I think that tells us something very important about the politics of identity now. We have this tendency to think, because the politics of identity is increasingly the only game in town, and everyone has to play it, we have this tendency to think it's very strong. It's on the march. You know, the identitarians are marching through the institutions and forcing everyone to buy into their identity claptrap often. But actually, I think the new politics of identity is built on the collapse of real identity and the weakness of people's sense of themselves. And I think that's the kind of era that we're living in. I just want to touch on two things quickly. Firstly, the question of where this new identity politics comes from. And secondly, the question of what we lose as a result of it. So on the question of where it comes from, I think it's fundamentally the corrosion of public life, the corrosion of, of national life, which gives rise to this, this new desperate attempt to create new identities, often from nothing, often just utterly invented after reading a blog post and thinking, oh, I feel like that too. Uh, you know, it's the demise of the institutions and the ways of life through which people once derived a sense of themselves. It's that which underpins the new kind of scrabble for a new identity. You know, the, the fall of churches and their influence, of trade unions, of old politics, even of the idea of the nation, which is a very unfashionable idea these days. And as we know, national identity is also in great crisis. The fall of all those institutions, the crisis of all those institutions, means people find it very difficult to know who they are or what they are or what their sense of self is. And that gives rise to this kind of frenetic search for an identity where you patch all these different feelings together and say, whoa, this is who I am. And so what happens is that identity becomes this very insecure phenomenon, very shaky, very insecure, very fluid, uh, which is why you get terms like gender fluid, which you, know, you, you might think is a fancy term for incontinence or something, but gender fluid is where your gender changes all the time. Um, and I think that idea of fluidity really speaks to the, the weakness of identity, how unanchored it is in any of the ways of life and, tr and institutions people might once have defined themselves through. And you can really see that in the rise of the term, I identify as, uh, which, I, which I find a very fascinating term. You know, in the past, people said, I am. I am a Catholic. I am Irish, I am whatever. Obviously, I'm talking about myself, self-obsessed. Uh, you, you were something, I am. It was a declaration, it was confident, you were certain, you knew what you were. Now you say, I identify as, which basically means, I think I'm this thing, mm, I'm not sure, and maybe I won't be this thing tomorrow. It's a very contingent, weak phrase, and it suggests that this stuff can change because you don't really know what you are. You just identify as something because you have a certain feeling. And that changeability was really captured. I read a piece recently about this man slash woman whose identity changes on a daily basis. So one day he is Lauren and the next day he is Larry, depending, literally depending on what he feels like in the morning. And of course everyone has to indulge this fantasy. And everyone has to refer to him as he or she, depending on his feeling, which uh, uh, otherwise you are transphobic. And I think it's the weakness of identity politics, which is why it is so intolerant often. That's why on campuses in particular, you're not allowed to criticize certain aspects of transgenderism, for example. 
That's why the new identity politics is so desperate for validation. They will literally corner you and say, do you accept my identity? And if you don't, you're a racist or a transphobic or a misogynist or whatever else. They need that validation because the new politics of identity is actually profoundly needy and desperate, is constantly seeking approval precisely because it's so weak. And I think that's a very striking thing. And then finally, uh, the question of what is lost as a consequence of the rise of this politics of identity, I think something incredibly important, which is the possibility of any kind of humanist politics whatsoever. That's really what's lost, because what identity, the new identity politics calls into question is the capacity of humankind to move beyond biological categories, to move beyond race, to move beyond gender and sex and all those other things, uh, except um, where you play with those in, an, in a childish, fluid way. What it also uh, contributes is this a very essentializing process where you are defined by uh, your individual identity, your sexual preferences, your race, and so on. And it really calls into question the whole idea that drove the progressive movement for years and years and years, which was that people should be judged by their character, not their color. In, in essence, that, saying that on some American campuses is now considered a racial microaggression. Uh, say, quoting Martin Luther King is now considered a racial microaggression because it denies people's racial experiences. So what we have is this extremely fragmenting process where people constantly distinguish themselves from others. The new identity politics invites you to constantly distinguish yourself from others, and it's a very separatist idea. And I think, actually, the idea of checking your privilege Checking your white male privilege is part of this process of self-distinction. That's really about largely middle-class white men distinguishing themselves from other white men who aren't as switched on and racially aware. So even that has that real uh, process of self-distinction. Um, so my final point would be simply that the problem with this identity politics is that it speaks to the corrosion of all the good things that we might once have defined ourselves through. It makes solidarity and humanist politics utterly impossible. And the way to address this problem of identity politics is not to take the piss out of it, which is really good fun, I know, but is actually to repair public life, because it's the collapse of public life that has nurtured this new politics. Okay. Uh, just on the, the class question, class is not an identity. Class is a social condition. It's a social category. And the whole point of class politics, tradition, class politics traditionally is that class could be transcended. You could end the working class. The aim of work, radical working class politics was to get rid of the working class so that that category would no longer exist. Now what you have, as Claire says, is the ossification of class as just another fixed identity. You're born working class, you're a working class person, you'll stay working class so we have to help you. It's really backward and I think that really speaks to actually the elephant in the room in this discussion which is the end of class politics. And what the left did in response to the end of class politics was not say let's sit down and talk about how this happened and what we should do about it but they added this kind of lick of paint on it say oh now we have identity politics and it's wonderful. So we're not just interested in class, we're interested in gay politics and women's politics and black politics and it was the thing that replaced class politics and we at least should be honest about that. I still think class is an important thing. Politically, it doesn't have much clout, but it's still an important fact. That, uh, it's still, I think, the most important experience. So, for example, a black working-class person who spends uh, nine hours a day on a building site has far more in common with his white workers on that building site than he does with black academics or black writers or, or, or black lead student leaders who claim to speak on behalf of all black people. There are differences here which which are incredibly important. I think uh, the, the thing that really worries me about the identity thing is just this continual fragmentation. It's fragmenting more and more all the time. So actually, you don't just have something anymore like the gay identity. Even that fragments. So now, being a, a white middle-class gay man is almost as bad as being a straight man. It's like, oh, you can't speak for black gays or, or mm -hmm. lesbians from uh, the north of England, or whatever else. So even within those identity groups, it fragments and fragments all the time so that you just get these tiny little sects, which is really dangerous. Uh, On the question of is there anything wrong with inventing and reinventing your identity, it's a bit tragic. It always reminds me of what Julie Birchall said about Madonna. If she was any good, she wouldn't have to keep reinventing herself. And that's how I feel about this constant <laughs> reinvention. But there is a contradiction in relation to identity at the moment, which is that on the one hand, it's very fluid and volatile, 
volatile and unstable, but on the other hand, it's quite rigid and it's always seeking to be firmed up with medical authority or government approval and so on. So it, it's actually very illiberal because it locks the person into a kind of, they almost become psychic slaves where they're constantly needing the validation of officialdom in particular. Uh, and I think that give, makes for a very unpleasant experience, no doubt. On the Renaissance man and humanist politics, humanist politics is getting a bad rap on this panel. Uh, the idea that it's arid is, strikes me as uh, very unusual. Um, my view is that the, the humanist politics, in its best sense, was a struggle against the separation of man into different racial, biological, sexual, man and woman, into various different categories, which we were told defined them, uh, influenced them, made them capable of certain things and incapable of other things. Humanist politics was a struggle against that. Identity politics is an accommodation to it. It refashions that, those old divisions, those ethnic, communal, racial divisions, as something progressive, as something worth celebrating, as something worth clinging onto. That is the difference. Humanist politics wanted to get rid of it. Identity politics builds it back up. Final point, uh, I'm not worried about tension or divisions in society at all. I think they're a very good thing. I would prefer that they were not ethnic tensions or communal tensions, which is what identity politics gives rise to, but rather political and social tensions which is why I think someone asked about Brexit. Brexit, to my mind, is the best thing that has happened in British politics in a generation. I, it's the first thing in my lifetime I'd go to the barricades for. I'd burn down the House of Commons for Brexit. Brexit is the greatest thing because, I'll tell you why, because Brexit exposed that there are class, geographical, social tensions in this country. And that is a good thing and we ought to talk about them but instead of course everyone who voted Brexit has been demonised as a racist and a xenophobe and low information <laughs> i.e. stupid because uh, the establishment cannot handle the reality that is potentially revealed by Brexit. Yeah on the question of you know isn't this just kind of individualism taken to its logic conclusion this is not individualism, what we're talking about now. Individualism in its traditional sense, if you go back to John Stuart Mill, the idea of individualism was the strong, free-willed, capable individual who could, who could understand the world around him, on, him or her and could engage with it as a reasoned creature. That's what individualism was. This is the complete opposite of that. This signals actually the death of individualism because this is about identities that are fragile, where it's assumed you can't hear certain ideas or engage with certain ideas without having a nervous breakdown, where you're constantly seeking the validation of everyone around you because you're so needy. That is not individualism. That is the crisis of individualism personified. And I think the, the, the important thing about individualism in the past, the idea of the free-willed individual, all of whom had a shared capacity to reason and engagement, was that that fueled humanism, that fueled the universal idea. People often think there's a contradiction between individualism and universalism, but actually they, they feed into each other extremely well. The problem with the politics of identity is that it utterly undermines both. It undermines individualism by creating a sense of the fragile self who constantly needs therapeutic scaffolding all around him, and it undermines universalism by putting us all into these tiny little boxes. That's why we should reject the politics of identity. It undermines those two great creeds of progressive modern politics.